Okay, now let's go to the quiz. Okay, so here's our quiz. It says the average amount of money that customers spend at a pub is $35 and the standard deviation is $12. Okay, figured I should put this in because I think we're starting to open a few things up. I'm not sure pubs are open yet, but um, they should be soon, hopefully. Um, so for each, find the distribution, then answer the question, then determine if the assumption that the distribution of the population is normal was necessary for your calculation. Okay, and the first question is find the probability that if the pub has 58 customers on a Saturday night, that the total revenue will be more than $2,000. Okay, so let me start reading this question number one, and there's a really important word that gets us started in, our terms, of find, in terms of getting that distribution. What's the important word in question number one? And it's a word, not a number. Um, I don't see the word sum in question number one. What's the important word that's actually in the question? So I'll let you read through it. Yeah, the uh, total, one word is total. When you see the word total, that means that we're looking at the distribution of a sum. We're not looking at the distribution of a single individual. We're not looking at the distribution of a mean, and we're not looking at the distribution of proportions either. We're talking about the distribution of a sum. So that's the first thing, is that we're talking about the distribution of a sum. We know we have 58 customers. That's the sample size. The mean for the original distribution is 35 because that's the average, and the standard deviation is 12, because it says so. So with all that information, what we can do is we can answer the first part of part one. And the first part, is that the symbol we're gonna use so what symbol do we use when we're talking about a total? Do you remember? So what's the symbol that we use for total? Yeah, yeah, it's as good as you can get on a, on a keyboard. Um, so we're gonna use that summation sign, which is capital sigma, which I can find in here. So sigma, and I think what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to insert, and what I need is tilde. Now let's go back, and then n for normal. Okay, is the mean is the mean thirty five for this distribution? What do you think? Okay, it's not, because we're talking about totals, we're talking sigma, so it's 35 times 58 was our sample size. Comma, and then the standard deviation, the formula says we're supposed to take the standard deviation, that we had, which is 12, and we're supposed to divide it. Except I need to divide this way. I okay, not divide it by, we're supposed to multiply it by the square root of 58. Any questions on that? Any questions? All right, if you do this arithmetic, I did it in advance, so 
you can just drop it in your uh, you know Google Power. Or you can go with basic calculator. Thirty five times fifty eight is twenty thirty. I guess not tilde anymore. It's actually equal and twenty thirty. And then uh, twelve times the square root of fifty eight is ninety one point three three nine two seven seven three. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, again, none of these are meant to be trick questions. Just they're meant to say, well, do you understand what we've been doing? And we're talking about totals. And the total, the formula is you multiply the mean times the sample size. And that gives you your sampling distribution for the total. And to find the standard deviation, of the sampling distribution for the total, you multiply the standard deviation times the square root of the sample size. Any questions so far? Okay, now what we need to do, because remember in the question, let's pop it in. It said, find the distribution, I just did that, that had the tilde in it. Then answer the question. Answer the question means we get to do the calculation. So let's do the calculation. So to do the calculation, we definitely need our calculator. And for the calculator, what number do we go to in this case? You got different decimals for the standard deviation. Let me look again. Let's make sure that I wrote it right. So we have 12 times the square root of 58. Maybe I copied it wrong. 12 times the square root of 58. And it's 91.389. Oh, it should be 89. I think I had a 339. I think I did type it in wrong. So let's fix that. Okay, that's better. Okay, so which number for the calculator? That we need? Yeah, number seven, it's a normal probability. So for the normal probability, we want to find out again, we want to find out what is the probability that we're greater than 2,000. So greater than 2,000 tells you low is 2,000. What's the high? Yeah, a bunch of nines. This is, this is one you want to put, a, you know, not just three nines. That's not enough because these are big numbers already. So a bunch of nines. And then the mean was 2030. The standard deviation was this messy number, 91.389.773. And I hit calculate. And you get about 0.6286. So let's write that out. So the probability that the total is greater than 2,000 is equal to, again, that was 0.6286. Any questions so far? Okay, now if we go to the original question, it said determine if the assumption that the distribution of the population is normal was necessary for the calculations. So let's go to our problem. Do we need to assume the distribution of the population is normal? 
What do you think? What do y'all think? Okay, and then how come? Yeah, so we do not need to assume that the population distribution is normal since 58, that was our sample size, is greater than 30. So the central limit theorem guarantees normality. Okay, so no assumption needed. Remember, assuming means that you don't know, so we're just gonna guess, even though it's probably not right. So it's never good to have to assume. But here, we don't have to assume, we do know. Any questions on, on uh, part one? Okay, let's go to part two. So part two, it's gonna be similar. Let's read it first. So at a table, a table at the pub seats six people. Find the IQR for the total revenue for tables that are filled with six people. Okay, so in terms of the first step, it's basically the same, except now we have six people instead of 58. Which means, I can copy and paste. There's my sigma, because we still have a sigma. And then tilde. Now it's not gonna be exactly the same, but at least I can start there. So what number changes here? At least on the left. Yeah, N, but what number is that? So what do you see that doesn't shouldn't be there? Yeah, the no the 12 was fine actually. The 58 is the issue. Because our N now instead of 58 is six. So this 58 becomes a six. Any questions at all? Any questions at all on dealing with this? Okay, 35 times 6. I'll do this one in my head. That's the same as 70 times 3, which is 210. Okay, um, 12 root 6. I'm not so good at doing it in my head. Not when it comes to lots of decimal places. So let's go 12 root 6. So 12 square root of six, and that is It's good enough. So 29, 29.3988. 29.3. 9388, I think. Let me double check again. 29.3988. Yep, that's correct. Any questions so far? Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to understand our strategy. How is this question different than part one? So let me remind you what the question stated. It says, uh, table of the pub seats six people, find the IQR for the total revenue. So how is this pretty different? Let 
any ideas? Yeah, here it's um, not find the, we know the percentiles, that's the thing. So it's not that we're trying to find the percentiles, we know the percentiles, so we need to find X. So now we, we're, we know our P, we need to find, in this case, the upper value. So let's pop some numbers in. And the first thing, by the way, let me um, go back here. Let me copy that one so I don't have to type it again. And now I can go to the calculator and it was 210, by the way. So again, my calculator, my standard deviation was 29.39388, no dollar sign. And the mean was 210. This time we know our P, if we want the IQR, what do we start with for P? Yeah, 0.25, because remember the IQR is the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. So 0.25. And here, our, our low is negative a zillion nines, and our high is the unknown. Any questions on that? And they calculate, and you get 190.17. So let's just write that in, this one. So notice that Q1 is equal to 190.17. And we also need to find Q3. So to find Q3, we don't know the high, but what's our new probability? What's the probability here? Yeah, 0.75. And hit calculate, and you get 229.83 or so. 229.83. So finally, to find the IQR, we subtract. So IQR is equal to 229.83 minus 190.7.17. And we can drop that in the fancy calculator. And it says 39.66. Okay, that's, that's the second part of part two. Now, we need to determine if the assumption that the distribution of the population is normal was necessary. So what do you think? Was it necessary? Why was it necessary this time? Yeah, now we have a sample size of six, and six is less than 31, I like to say. So notice that since six is less than 31, the central limit theorem does not guarantee that the sample size. Um, so why 31? Because you're, you're feeling like 30. Um, so in our class, by the way, we, we're saying more than 30 is big enough. So if it's 30, it's not big enough. If it's 31, it's big enough. So that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing. And it, it's, it's not 100% standard, but the majority of classes that I've talked to other instructors, they use 30 also.
So 30 is the cutoff line. 30 or below, not big enough. Above 30, 31 and above, big enough. So it's less than 31. You could also say it's less than or equal to 30. That's the same thing. But that's harder to type. Um, what's the math behind that? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this a lot in this class when you ask this question. Hard. <laughs> um, you can actually you can actually figure out what that means. So it's not like it's not like there's a sudden change of thirty. Um, but you get about a decimal place of accuracy in most situations, at around that thirty. It turns out if you want two decimal places, you really need to be over a hundred. So it depends on depends on how much you want. Okay. Okay, and I should say significant digits. So nothing's perfect, but we have to choose something as a guiding principle, and that's a good guiding principle. Okay, um, the math is very difficult, by the way. The central limit theorem involves a very hard calculus, and this is calculus is not a prereq of this class, so I'm not going to answer. Okay, but I know the answer; I just won't do it. Okay, so um, so it does not guarantee that the population distribution, I mean the, um, not population, the sample size, sampling distribution is normal. So we must assume that the population distribution is normal. Any questions at all about the first question? Okay, notice by the way, um, actually I, I won't even show you, but there's a lot more there. Number two is gonna be quicker. This is important, but it'll be quicker because I didn't have you do all the calculations. Okay, so let's look at question two. Okay. And by the way, you'll notice something that there's no calculator embedded in question two. Okay. That's a hint, by the way. That means that if you used, if you use a normal distribution calculator, um, you probably got it wrong. <laughs> Just let you know that because you don't need it. Okay. So mortality rate for people age 20 to 29 who get COVID-19 is 0.2%. Okay. And um, that's the latest data that I was able to find when I wrote the quiz um, uh, five days ago, Thursday I wrote the quiz. So just let you know that it's a very small mortality rate. Almost all of them have immune deficiency issues. But there is a mortality rate. People do die, just not very many of that age group. So if you keep track of 100 people with COVID-19 age 20 to 29, would this be a large enough sample size to use a normal distribution to approximate the binomial distribution when looking at mortality? Explain numerically. Okay, what is the key to answering this part A question? It's a key thing you should be looking at here. Yeah, we want to find out as large enough sample. Now, can we just say that, hey, we're looking at 100. 100 is greater than 30. Yes, it's a large enough sample. There's numerically. So, we, um, so we're so we good. What do you think? What's wrong with that argument? Right. You know it can't be right because I didn't just type it. But what's wrong with the argument? Yeah, what's wrong with it, the main thing that's wrong with it is you should always think about what is the survey question, okay? Or what kind of data are you collecting? You're gonna follow this first person who has COVID-19 
And what are you gonna are you gonna what are you gonna write down after waiting long enough? What are you gonna write down about that person? You're gonna write down a what, what are you gonna say? Right? What's the survey question? Or what might you ask this person's doctor? When when whatever it is is over. Any thoughts? I don't see y'all jumping in. So what are you going to ask the doctor about this one patient? I don't see y'all jumping in, but this is important. And again, this is one of the central things you have to know in this class. If you're not telling me, then I, I want to let you know that it's not good enough to just hear me. But you need to be able to do this yourself. The survey question is, did your patient die? Is that clear? And the answer to that survey question is either yes or no. Okay, it's not a number. So that means it's not quantitative data. And when we have non-quantitative data, we have proportions. That means that the number 30 is not anything to do with whether it's nor normal or not. What's more important is what number? What is the key number in this example? Not 30, but looking for a number. Yeah, five. So what we wanna do is we wanna say is NP greater than five? I guess not is, but R because there are two things, NP greater than five and NQ greater than five. So in other words, let's look at NP. What's N in this case? That's supposed to be easy. Yeah, 100. What's P in this case? That's a little harder, it's not that bad, no? Yeah, it's 0 0.002, because 0.2% is 0 0.002. And that is actually equal to 0 0.2. And that's certainly less than five, okay? Or less than six, because that's what we're testing. Greater than five means if you're less than six, you're not, you don't have it. Okay, just like 31 versus 30. So it's six versus five. So therefore, you cannot use the normal distribution on this. Since the sample size is too small. Any questions on that? Okay, and by the way, once we get under, once we once we don't get over five for NP, you don't even have to check NQ. You have to have both of them. So once one of them don't work, doesn't work, you're done. Uh, there's no questions like this on the homework. Okay, so I'm giving you one now. <laughs> you need to be able to know this. Um, we talked about this in the lecture on Thursday, and I try to test you on what was lectured on Thursday. I want to let you know that this is one of the most important things to get when it comes to um, places where people make mistakes. That's why I'm asking it. Okay. And I know this is going to sound weird, but I have had former students multiple times leave my office in tears. Okay. Do you know why? These are former students, not current students. Former students who passed my class. You know why? Okay, they're former students and they're getting their master's degrees. And they're, they come to me for help on their thesis, for their master's thesis. And I look at what they've done and their sample size is too small. And I let them know this isn't gonna work, that you're never gonna be able to publish this paper. 
you have too small a sample size because MP and NQ are not bigger than five, and everything you did is wrong. Okay, I hate being harsh, but I have to tell the truth. And I say you need to get a bigger sample size, and they say I don't have time. And it never ends well. And it, it's not it's not because I'm being mean. I'm just being you know honest about statistics. So it's very very important that you understand that NP and NQ both have to be bigger than five. And we're gonna be doing this for the entire quarter. It's gonna happen for chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 10. Uh, it just keeps going. So very important, that's why I made sure this is in it. Remember the quizzes are less value in terms of points than the homework. So it's not like I could give an exam question where you've never seen it before. But now you've seen it, which means you will get an exam question. So B, if instead of 100 in your study, you wanted to decrease the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, okay, which is, by the way, the, stand, the standard error, by a factor of six, how large a sample size will you now need? Okay, so now we have an equation to use. So again, we started with 100, we want to, we want to decrease by a factor of six. So let me go to an equation. And the equation is sigma sub x bar, because that's what we're looking at is a standard error, which is sigma sub x bar. So let's write that out. Sigma sub x bar. I'm one of these guys. If it isn't, I'll just type it. Nope. So I'm just going to type it. There's a way to do it, but I don't want to go there. X bar is equal to who remembers the formula? This is a really important formula. Okay. If you don't remember, it's the square root of fraction PQ divided by N. So what's important here, let's uh, pop this in. What's important is we want to decrease. Uh, what's Q? Q is one minus P. So let's write that out. Q equals one minus P. It's kind of standard. It means it's less typing. So that's why most people use one, Q instead of one minus P. So if you haven't seen that, you've seen it now. Yeah, so it's just a notation. Okay, so if we want to decrease by a factor of six, that means, well, we have n, that's our denominator. And what does n have to be to de decrease by a factor of six when we have that big square root there? And the idea is, if you want to decrease by a factor of six, we need to multiply by 36. Because if you multiply by 36 and take a square root, that's the same thing as multiplying by six. So multiply the 100, which is n, let me write that down, by 36. Maybe even I'll write it this way, just so you see. 6 squared. The whole point is we need the square and the square root to cancel. So we need to multiply by 6 squared. And so we sample 3,600. People. Any questions at all on the quiz. Any questions? 
Okay, I do want to remind you the quiz is not a test. The quiz is a good, it's a small number of points, but it's a good study guide for the exam. So your next exam in a few weeks. So that's just a note is that you'll want to come back to the quiz and then, you know, retry it before the exam so you get all this information. Any questions at all on the quiz? Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I want to I pop in an article. But even before I do that, see how you guys feel. What do you think? Do you, we're talking about, I'm going to talk about November. Okay, so what's happening um, a little bit less than six months from now? Yeah, the election. So here's the question. Question I have for you. This isn't yet a statistics question, but it will be soon. Is that if we're at the point where we're not able to go to the ballot, okay, because things haven't gotten better, which is a possibility. I, I don't want to, don't get mad at me if I give you possible bad news, but it's a possibility we can have a second wave because that is fall. And they're saying that with the virus often, um, you get a second wave in the fall that we're not going to be able to go to the ballot in November. So here's a question I have for you, and I want you to put a yes or no. Is do you think that they should just replace it if if it's um if we have a second wave, do you think we should replace the voting by mail-in ballot? Okay, instead of postponing. Because that might be the case. Postponing or endangerment. Okay, so we got some yeses and more yeses and noes. So, um, well, they're already doing in California. I haven't, I actually haven't uh, sent my ballot. I haven't gone to the ballot place, you know, on the election day in years. I always do mail in. So, California already does that. Um, so let's go to an article and let's see if you agree with everyone. Okay. Uh, okay, if we go to the grocery store, why can't we go in to vote? I think I'm not gonna get involved in that. Um, yeah, the question is, is voting essential? That's the big question. And that's a whole different question, which I'm not gonna get into. I wanna get into this though. And this is um, a poll that was done. I mean, a, uh, an article from Gallup. And it says, most Americans favor voting by mail as option for November. Okay. Yeah, I'll put the app too, but I think that one's going to be harder to sell, by the way. Um, so mail in, it's a bunch of old people. They don't like apps. Okay. Um, even both people running for president. <laughs> They're older. Okay. Most Americans favor voting by mail as option in November. Do they know this? What do you think? So do they know for sure that most Americans favor voting by mail as an option? Okay, how, how do we know they don't know for sure? We've talked about this before. Yeah, they didn't ask me either. They didn't ask any. My guess, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but did they ask any of you? Okay. Yeah, they definitely didn't ask any everyone, so they can't know about it, most Americans. All right, so instead, what we're going to say instead, or we're going to look at is, is it very likely that most Americans favor voting by mail? Okay, so is it likely that most Americans favor, uh, favor voting by mail as an option? And that's going to be really the question we're going to look at, because if, if it's likely and they say it, then, and if they're almost always right, then that's good enough for news. Okay, this is, this is not proof. It's not a mathematical proof of anything. And in fact, if you scroll to the bottom of this article, they asked 1,016 adults. Okay, by the way, is that a lot when you compare it to how many adults there are? How many um, 
adults there are in America? No, not at all, right? Okay, there's probably, you know, 200 million adults in America, maybe a little bit more, 330 or so, 340 million people, but some of them are young. Um, and they're only looking at age 18 or older for various reasons. Okay, one is so they don't get sued. The other is that's probably what you care about by for elections, although 17 and a half should be good enough, but they don't want to get sued. Uh, so that's one issue is that they only asked 1,016. Do you think they asked enough? Do you think they asked enough to be confident that their results are right? What do you think? Yeah, we're going to assume it was representative. We're going to assume it's representative. We're going to assume that they have an unbiased sample, that they, they randomly surveyed people, which is probably false, but we're going to make that assumption. Um, because again, we're in chapter eight now. We've already talked about the issue with, chap with uh, bias, and that was chapter one. Um, so the question is, did they survey enough? And that's what we're going to be able to answer. Okay. Here's another thing, and this is something you talk about, is they want to be 95% confident. Okay, One of the reasons why I like going to Gallup when I show it to you all is that Gallup actually gives the details. Whereas if I did the same thing on, um, I don't know, CNN or Fox or you know one of those, they're not going to give this 95% confidence level information. And um, Gallup does, so I like it, even though actually this article has been in many places. A lot of people quote Gallup and they use it, but Gallup's got this in there. And I want to emphasize this 95% confidence level. But what does it mean? What do you think, what do you think 95% confidence level means? You might have seen it before, you might not have, but you can maybe get a feel for it just from the words. And I'm going to do the get the feel for, and later we'll get into more technical stuff. So what do you think it means? Okay, they're almost sure that they're correct, right? Or you could say 95% sure they're correct. Okay. So that's one way of thinking about it. I'm going to throw some statistics vocabulary. Instead of sure, how about there's a... 0.95 probability that they're correct. That's a little closer to what you know what we want to think about because remember this is a statistics class. Okay, 95% of the data falls in their assumption. Okay, that one sounds good, but what do you mean the data? Remember the data. The survey question here is: Do you think that um, we should go to mail-in ballot? And the answer is yes or no. So what does it mean to say that it's not just that 95% of the people said yes, that's definitely not it. Does that make sense? Ah, so you have a good question. Is this where statistically significant comes in? Kind of, but next week, much more so. So I'm gonna get more into that next week. Um, this week, we're going to kind of kind of stay away from that, and then I'll talk about why it still works. But I've learned from my teaching that if I talk about it now, it confuses the hell out of everyone um, when it comes to the next test. So I'm going to separate that one out and say, let's hold off on statistically significant. Right now, I'm just going to say 95% confidence. So, by the way, um, why do you think they use 95%? Why not 90%? Or 99%. Any ideas? And my guess is you probably don't know because it has nothing to do with math. It's actually history. And they use it because that's what New York Times decided to use in the 1930s. And in those days, there was no internet you know, in the 1930s, not even close to it. And New York Times pretty much ruled the world when it came to these. So they decided that 95% is good enough. That 
it's okay if they're wrong 5% of the time. But, and they chose that, okay? They could have chosen 99, they could have chosen 90. But, and again, we'll talk about the pros and cons of those. Any questions so far on this idea? Any questions? All right, so either later today or on Thursday, we're gonna get into the mathematical details for this example or examples like this. Any questions so far? Is that clear so far? Okay, so now what does it mean to have, what does it truly mean to have 95% confidence? And what I wanna do is I wanna talk about, now I'm gonna go here away from the news for a bit. News can get old after a while. I wanna talk about the confidence interval. So I wanna talk about this 90, and I'll use 95%. Um, not everyone uses 95%, but all news does, okay? And in fact, um, there's kind of three main percents that people will use. 95 is the most common, and let me go through the 95, and I'll talk about changing it. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna draw some pictures. Okay, first thing, we get a good old x-axis. And then let's put in I'm not a perfect artist, but that's supposed to be a normal curve. Okay. I know it's got some wiggles, but that's as good as I can do, especially on the computer. Okay. Without programming. So there's our distribution. Okay. And by the way, with this example, um, is there a better calculator to find the correlating z score? Um, Maybe depending on what you're asking for, the word correlation is going to happen in three weeks, and we don't talk about z-score with it, but there is a z-score embedded calculator, or there's a calculator and put in, because it's just a quick arithmetic. This is x minus mu over sigma. So you don't need an embedded calculator to do arithmetic, and very basic arithmetic. Um, but that's a very different question that we're looking at now, which is confidence intervals. Unless you're asking something different, which might be true. Not sure. Okay, but what we got is a normal distribution. First thing is, um, do you think there's a normal distribution for the example I just showed you, the news example? Do you think it's uh, approximately normal? What do y'all think? If you're not sure, let's go. Let's go over and look at that example again. So we had a little over a thousand adults. Is that clear? That was the sample size at the end. Then, sixty-four percent favor the states allowing mail-in ballot. So, is the sample size large enough to show you have a normal distribution? The idea is it's not supposed to be very hard. Any thoughts? I don't see you all jumping in. Remember the formula? Hint, think about your quiz, the second problem on the quiz, part A. Which is why I gave it, because it's so important. Okay, I don't see y'all jumping in, but if you have, a, if you surveyed over a thousand people, 64% said yes, 64% of a thousand is 640. That's like way bigger than five. But remember, 36% said no, but 36% of a thousand is 360. Still way, 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 way bigger than five. So there's no issue. So 
you can definitely use the normal distribution to approximate the binomial in that case. And we can talk about normal distributions. And that's true of most good surveys, is you'll have a sample size large enough. All right, so now let me go back. So now we can actually say you can have this normal distribution because of the central limit theorem. If you have a large enough sample size, you're always going to get a normal distribution for the sampling distribution. Then what we can do Have to do it this way. It is the following. We can look at this region, and what we can say is I'm going to shade in a bit. Let's see. Just scribble a bit. We can say we want this area of this middle part to be how much? Sixty-four percent. Sixty-four percent turns out to be the center. Yeah, ninety-five percent, point nine five. Whereas the center, and let's write that in too, since you mentioned it. And again, we're, I'm just giving you the idea. We're not actually, we're not going to do the calculation on this now but I want to show you what's going on. This is 0.64. Right, because that's what the central limit theorem tells us. It tells us that our best guess for the population proportion is a sample proportion. And what we want to do is we want to say, well, let's pop these guys in. What's this guy? And What's this guy? Any questions on the question? Any questions on what we're looking at? Okay, and the idea here is that if we have those two, those two numbers, then what we can say is that we have a 95% confidence that the population mean will be between those two numbers. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, and uh, I'm gonna show you how to do this by hand first and then we're not gonna do it by hand again. But I figured, I think it's good to see how this relates to what we've been doing all this time. Um, is that a parameter or does the parameter have to survey the entire population? That's a good question. So the question is, how do I get this to fit in? Just a minute. So the question is, is are these two numbers, that, when you say that, I think you mean those, right? Those two numbers, are they parameters? Or are they um, statistics? 
I think that's what your question is, right? And the answer to that is they are statistics. And they're statistics because they're coming from the sample. They're not coming from the population because do we know the population? What I'm not able to do is get to that save and close. I'm, I'm fighting this. <laughs> Yeah, the only way to get uh, the only way to get to know I want to say know a parameter is to is to survey everyone. But what they are is they are estimates for the parameter, and that's what statistics are all about. The statistics are estimates for the parameter, and so the low and the high of this range will be statistics because they come from the sample. Okay, whereas the true population proportion will never know, but we can guess at. So this is guessing at using statistics. What I'm not able to do is get to that one. No, it's not letting me get out of this. So. All right. I'm gonna to have to unshare and then reshare, see if that works. Just a second. All right, well, I apologize for that because it's not giving it to me. It's not letting me go fast. Let's try the back button. No, that didn't work. I think so. so yeah, the save and close is not invisible because it's, the screen is too small or something. No, that didn't work. So I'm gonna have to, unfortunately, start again. Sometimes when I do Zoom and Google at the same time, things happen. I apologize. All right. Okay, so picture's gone, but you understood it, hopefully. Okay, so that is the idea of the confidence interval. Any questions on that? So the confidence interval is that interval at which you can say there's a 95% probability that the number, the, the sample proportion or mean, or the population proportion or mean is in between those numbers based on our sample. Okay, so let's go and do an example with y'all. I'm gonna do one with me now. Okay, you don't have that many people? So we're gonna have a small sample size. There's all kinds of bad assumptions I'm gonna make. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, everyone has to participate because that'll make the sample size a little bit bigger. <laughs> Sound good? Um, I'll even participate to make it big enough, which means you gotta pop it into the chat box. Okay. And um, so let's, let's think about something. How about, and uh, you can estimate, which is fine, how many miles from Lake Tahoe Community College were you born at? And put in the chat box, I'll put mine too, because I'm about 500. Believe it or not, I was born on a military base in San Diego area. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do Go to the calculators. 
Yeah, you might have to go to Google and look it up. You can just guess, that's okay. I just need some numbers. You don't know where you're born or you don't know how far away it was. Hopefully you know where you're born. Most people know that. <laughs> so by the way, a, uh, a 10K is about six miles. So if you divide by 10 and multiply by six, that's a good way of getting from, uh, from kilometers to miles. Okay, I know that because I used to run 10Ks a lot. 6.2 miles to be exact. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the confidence interval for a mean with data. We're gonna pop it into a calculator. And let me read this because you're gonna have to know how to do this too. So type in the values of the data set separated by commas. So now I have to go to the chat box and get all the data, data values. Okay. So we have 3,000. We have 500. We have 500. We have 180. Okay. That sounds like close to Sacramento. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, we have 6,500. Just a note, I want to remind you, because this is a problem uh, for some of you before, is that don't put in commas in your number. So don't put six comma five zero zero. Make sure you put in six five zero zero without a or you're gonna get a um, an error. Okay. And we don't have another one, you wanna guess? 1975, sounds good enough. Okay. All right. We do not know sigma, so leave that one blank. Let's use a 95% confidence level. And by the way, it'll tell you, it says enter 0 0.95 for CL. So 0.95. And let's calculate. Wait a minute. There could be a typo on this. This could be a programming error. I better work on fixing that this afternoon if there is an error, because it's not giving me a good answer. So let's do it with another calculator I built, which I know works. Um, That's only if you know the standard deviation, which we don't. And that might be the issue, is I might have hit the wrong one. Confidence interval, mean with data. Confidence interval, mean with data. No. I gotta check my, I gotta check on that. You shouldn't have to put the sigma in, it might be that, might be the problem. But what I can do, is I can go to this one. I know this one works because it's been tested by probably a million people already. In fact, there's two others on it. There's always people on this one. This one's shared by everyone in the world, it seems like. And let's pop these in again. So I'll check that out um, after this class is over. So 3,500. Five hundred, one eighty, sixty five hundred, and nineteen seventy five. And the confidence level is point is ninety five percent. Okay, so what we get is negative 418. We'll do the nearest mile, sounds good enough. So 4636. 
So let's write this down. So negative eight to this So so let's write this down. The ninety five percent. confidence interval for the population proportion, uh, population, sorry, mean number of miles that uh, people, since I'm in and I'm not a student, affiliated with LTCC were born from LTCC is negative 418 comma 4636. Just a note, by the way, are these numbers possible? Are all the numbers in between these intervals possible? Yeah, definitely not. And I want to let you know, this is something important about statistics, is that the mathematics, the, 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 the numbers that you get from the mathematics and doing statistics do not always have meaning. Okay, so often what you do is you look at the numbers, this is a good example of that, and you say, well, let's give it some meaning. And the idea here is that you can't, you can't have been born negative 418 miles from campus makes no sense okay what's the closest you could have been born from um from campus yeah zero okay which probably not a lot of people were but it could happen i guess uh, i will tell you as far as i know no one has ever been born at ltcc okay i'm pretty sure that's the truth i'm sure that's the truth actually i've been there a very long time and if that happened everyone would hear about it Okay, but you could have been born, let's say, let's say you were born, I don't know, in my house, then that could be zero miles because I live really close to campus and it, it could wrap. So let's write this down is that we can say with 95% confidence. The population mean number of miles that, um, and let's copy this out, so keep writing it. That people affiliated with LTCC were born from LTCC, okay, is between well, I'm not going to write for negative 418 because that's ridiculous. I can go 0 and 4636 miles. By the way, is this a very useful confidence interval? Because I want to emphasize a few things. Is this very useful? Like, now that we saw this, do you have information you can tell all your friends about? Because now you know that the population mean number of miles that people were born from LTC that are affiliated with the campus is somewhere between zero and 4,036, uh, 4,636. No, I mean, you probably, you knew that before I, we even looked at any numbers. I mean, that's way the hell away, <laughs> 4,336. Okay, the farthest you could have been born from um, campus is 12,000, but I mean, that, that's like really far away. <laughs> that's like near Madagascar. <laughs> okay, so if you look at an area of 4,636, that's first thing, it's more than all of the United States and Mexico. So of course it is, and, and more than that, actually a whole lot more. So this is not very meaningful. Why is it not, why, why do we not get meaningful data or information? Anyone guess, and this is really important. 
what happened? What went wrong? Something really went wrong. Yeah, the sample size is way too small. Okay, our sample size here was. It is. Yaffe tells you six, n equals six. So the sample size was six. So you should never, ever, ever do statistics with a sample size of six. Okay. Why did I do it? Since I just said you should never do it. Yes. All right, let me tell you, because that's all we had. And I didn't have time to go and ask, you know, 50 people or whatever. Uh, it's not, it wasn't to show you how irrelevant it was. It's just there was no way I was going to get a large sample. It'd be way too hard. Okay, especially nowadays where you can't even go to the campus. I get arrested if I went to the campus. <laughs> okay, so that's all. Okay, there are people in the class who are just not here. <laughs> not everyone goes to the webinars. They should, but there are others in the class. Okay, so we haven't had that many drops, but fewer people going to the webinars, which is a bad idea. We'll see if they pass. It's always hard if you don't go to the webinar. Uh, if it's only once or twice, that's all right. But if you miss them all, it's bad. Okay, so just to let you know. Um, all we did was six. This is a complete convenient sampling. Bias is everywhere. And the other thing is there's an assumption. What's the assumption? Besides no bias. Any guess? What's well, a big assumption that we made? Yeah, we assumed that the distribution of how far people uh, were born from campus is normal. Do you think that might be true? Do you think it might be normal? What do you think? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you this, this is not a math thing, but, it, but it's important to understand, it's absolutely not normal. I've been I've asked this question lots of times in the past 24 years. And so I kind of know where people were born, okay, on average. And there's a big cluster that were born at Bar Barton Hospital. Again, if you live far away, you may not know that. Um, Barton Hospital is three miles away. And then after that, you got to go like 100 miles, you know, or more, okay, unless you were born in Carson or something. Uh, so there's, there's like, it's definitely not normal. Okay, there's a skewness. Okay, there's a weird lump at three miles, and then it skews down from there. Okay, so this is a skewed right distribution, it turns out. Okay, now I didn't expect you to know that, but I'm telling you that from my experience that there's definitely a, a skewed right distribution because of the Barton babies. I like to call them that. Okay, and there's also clusters. Would it be normal? I don't, I don't know if it's normal anywhere. The problem is, is that even a big city, there's all the people that were born in the city, and there's all the people that were not born in the city. So it's probably bimodal for a big city, somewhat bimodal. So you got a big jump, big thing in the big city, and then fewer people everywhere else. Okay. So the answer is it's not normal. There's all kinds of problems with the study. So I wanna give you an example that you should never do, and that's this. Small sample size, bias study, not normal, just everything's wrong. But I do want to give an example of doing it at least. Any questions at all on this idea? Any questions? Okay, so now let's suppose we're gonna do the following. We wanna do another, let's, plan on doing another study. Okay, on 
how about how instead of how far people uh, live from campus, how about how many hours students spend for their education per year? Okay. So that's a nice study, you know, how many, how many um, hours over the last 365 days do students spend? Okay. And let's suppose we did a good study. Okay, or we can do, we're gonna do a good study. Okay, we're gonna ask, you know, a lot of people, maybe a hundred people, randomly generated, hundred people, you don't have to worry about normality anymore. This is definitely a numerical question. It's not a yes, no question. Is that clear? And suppose that we want, we will um, get a 95% confidence interval for this population mean. So now the question is, what does the 95% mean? What does it mean to even say 95%? It okay, once does. So what does it mean to say 95% confident? And I wanna talk about this a little more formally. And before you even do the study, we can say is that there will, there is a 95% probability that the confidence interval will contain the population mean. Okay, maybe even the confidence interval that we will end up with will contain the population mean. Okay, any questions on this idea? So this is really important and it's usually one of the harder things. So in particular, another way of saying this is that if we were to um, conduct a study many times, there would be a, I'm oh, sorry, there, then 95% of the confidence intervals that we would produce will contain the population mean. Any questions on this idea? This is the deepest and most difficult idea of the week, by the way. So that's why I keep saying it over and over again, because I want you to get it. So does it, it, before you even do the study, there's a 95% probability the confidence interval will end up uh, containing the population mean, okay? If you think of yourself as researchers, then sometimes you're gonna get lucky and sometimes you're not gonna get lucky. Getting lucky means that you've got a confidence interval that contains the population mean, because you wanna be right. Getting unlucky means that you missed it and the confidence interval didn't contain the population mean. That means you got it wrong. Any questions on this idea? Okay, I have a visualization of this. Let me find it. It's in the book that I popped in, I programmed it.
I think it's this one. Here it is. Okay, so what we can do is we can say, well, what if you have a small sample size? And let's suppose you don't want a confidence level of 0.09. Sorry about that. Let's suppose you want a 95% confidence level. And let's suppose you had a smaller sample size, like six. Then take a look at this. What this shows you, if you look at each of these bars, these are a win. These, these are the confidence intervals. So the left is the low side of the confidence interval, the right is the high side. Any questions on that? Okay, whereas the mean, which is I let be zero, that's just by default here. And do all of the confidence intervals hit the mean? What do you think? In this case, this example. Okay, if you look at the first one, it does. Do you see that? Look at the second, it does. The third, it does. The fourth, it does. Look at the fifth one, though. What's the problem? Okay, you'll notice the mean does not go through the fifth one. So this fifth one didn't make it. Okay, so it's like a failure. Okay, and again, it's not something you can ever do anything about if you have a fixed sample size and a fixed confidence level. It's what it is. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, what if we made the confidence level to be 99% instead of 95? What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen if we use a 99% confidence le level? Any thoughts? Yeah, you're gonna have larger intervals and you're gonna have more of the intervals hit the mean. So we'll do that. And here they all did, right? If you're gonna have 99% probability of hitting the mean and you're only gonna do, I don't know this, how many of these are there? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. There's 20 of them then they're probably all gonna hit the mean if there's a 99% chance, okay? But we saw it in the example we just did. The problem is, is now the, the width of the confidence interval is much bigger and you don't get much information, okay? Just like when we said, well, the average distance that you were born from campus, that people were born from campus that are affiliated with LTC, was between zero and over and 4,600 something. Sure, you're gonna be pretty confident of it, but it's useless. So instead what we can do is instead of a 99%, let's go to, how about, how about an 80% confidence level? And now what's the problem with the 80%? So what's the issue with the 80% confidence level? Because now they're, right, now they're, they're not as wide, so you get better information, except you might be wrong. So do you see the trade-off? By increasing the confidence level, you're more likely to be right, but you're gonna have useless information. Decreasing the confidence interval, 
your information will be u more useful if you're right, but you might not be right. Okay. If we went to a, which no one would ever do, a say 25% confidence level, then hey, the, these intervals are tiny. You know, you could be 25% confident that people live between 100 and 120 miles from, I were born at between 120 and 120 miles from campus. Well, sure, that's a nice small range, except look what happens. What do you notice? Okay, what you notice is almost all of them are failures. You see, there are a few right ones, but most are failures, and that's a disaster. So no one would ever use a 25% confidence level because nobody wants to be wrong 75% of the time. Any questions on that idea? Okay, what's the only way? Is that connected to um, standard deviation size? It is connected to standard deviation, but I want to let you know that the standard deviation is something you have no control over. Okay, we can't change the standard deviation of how far people were born from campus. Do you agree with that? A statistician can't do anything about that. But what can you control? How can you get both high level of confidence and most of the intervals actually making it and being right? Yeah, we can increase that sample size. So instead of n equals six, let's say we went n equals 60. And then we can go to a 95% confidence level. And you're going to be wrong 5% of the time on average still, but now we notice that the confidence level of the confidence interval is much smaller, even with a high confidence level. Any questions on that? We can go way up high, and let's say n is 100. then we'll see a very small width and we can still be right with a small width. Okay, then we can even go to say 99%. Okay, we're gonna be right all the time and the width still isn't that bad. Do you see that? But what's the problem? Why shouldn't you just always do a gigantic sample size? What's the, what's the reason? Yeah, time. Time and money, by the way. Sometimes money uh, is good enough because you could pay people to do it for you. So time and money. So it's kind of like, well, what if I told you for your projects, you needed to survey 1,000 people? Could you have done it? Yeah, it, it just wouldn't have happened, okay? What you probably would have done, I don't want to encourage this, by the way, you probably would have lied and cheated. <laughs> okay, don't do that, though. <laughs> okay, in the real world, you shouldn't do that. But that's, you know, you, hopefully you don't. So another example of why you don't do a large sample size, let me give you a next example. Um, anyone following what has hap what's happening right now in Oxford University? What's happening there? This is a current event, big deal. Okay. So in Oxford University, if you don't know, is they have a, yeah, we've talked about it in the last class. And um, so they have a vaccine. It worked on rhesus monkeys. Okay. Sounds great. But the problem is that the rhesus monkeys aren't people. So then the question is, you go to the next step. And the next step is you give a lot of people the vaccine. What's the problem with giving, say, a million people this vaccine that worked in rhesus monkeys and just doing that today? 
So you have a really big sample size. Okay. It may not have worked. Um, actually, that's a small problem. There's a much bigger problem. What if it killed people? <laughs> what if Reese's monkeys were fine with it, but every person they gave it to killed them within two weeks? Then you've just killed a million people. Do you see the issue? So there's issues with the large sample size also. Okay, now we talked about it last week, but now we can talk about confidence levels. So there's this big trade-off between large sample size, a large confidence level, and a small, what we're gonna call margin of error. Margin of error turns out to be how far, how far the outer limits are from the sample mean. Another way of saying it, it's half the width of the confidence interval. And you know, in the best of all worlds, you could have a large sample size, small margin of error, and a very high level of confidence. But there's issues with all three of them. Okay. So any questions on this idea? Any questions? Okay. And there's no answer, by the way, in you know, here's here's the answer to make everything wonderful all the time. Um, that doesn't happen. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to get a vaccine and be ready to just give it to everyone, because that would be nice. But there's all kinds of problems. And again, the problems are, what do you want to deal with? Do you want to have a big chance of killing a whole lot of people because a vaccine may not really work? And in particular, have side effects that kill people. Um, so then you have to do a small sample size. But then if you have a small sample size, then you're either going to do a low level of confidence. And if you do a low level of confidence, then your next step is say, hey, you know, I'm 70% confident that this stuff works. I'm going to go with it. But then you might kill people when you go with it. Okay. Well, the other choice is to instead have a small sample size, but then go for a, a large level of confidence. But the problem with that is there's a good chance that your results won't be correct, that the results won't show you reality, that your confidence interval won't contain the population mean or proportion, and then you're going to end up thinking that you have it and you don't. Okay, there's all kinds of problems. Okay, or you could have a very large margin of error, and yeah, you could be 99% confident that between 1% and 99% of the people who get it can't get the coronavirus, but that's useless information if the high mar if the margin of error is, is high. Okay. So what's the best C level, the confidence level? Okay, C levels are right typically. So in the news, they use 95%. Okay, in the news, they use 95%. That's just standard. That's the first thing. So it depends on who you are and what you're doing, okay? If there are very small replications for being wrong, then you could like drop it down to 90%. So um, to let you know, I, I do some statistics, some statistical consulting, I don't just do it. And, um, and the Forest Service, when I worked for them on some statistics, they were okay with 90%. They didn't have a big budget, so they couldn't get a big sample size. They decided that if they were wrong 10% of the time, then no one's going to die of it, so it was all right. Does that make sense? Okay. On the other hand, if being wrong is going to kill a lot of people and being right is not going to make people live, then you probably want to do 99 or higher. Do you see that? So it depends on the repercussions of being wrong. Any questions on that? Oh, I'm sorry, the microphone is now. I haven't actually moved my face, so I'm not sure. It might be the internet. The computer hasn't changed. So sorry about that. So, any questions on this idea of the confidence level versus the confidence interval, the sample size, and the margin of error? Any questions on this? Okay, I think I have time to do a proportions problem. So let's do a proportions problem and let's take a look. 
and let's do the one we were just looking at. And that's this guy. So while most Americans, 68%, favor the state, allowing all voters to vote by mail or absentee ballot, differences arise among key demographics groups. Now, I'm not going to get into the demographics. Um, that's a whole bigger issue, and that's advanced statistics. Okay, so again, this was, if you forgot, this was, do we favor voting by mail? And we want to say, well, let's come up with a confidence interval. Okay, and our sample size, and I'm going to show you and I'm going to write it as we go. So first thing is our, this 0.64, 64%. What, what letter do we use for that? Or what variable do we use for this 0.64? Who remembers? I talked about this last week. Last week was a big getting ready for this week. week. Who remembers what, what letter we used or what variable we used for 0.64? Not a standard deviation. Ask us for standard deviation. Yeah, good. P hat. This is P hat. P with a hat on top was 0.64. So that happened last week. And again, everything we did last week is coming back this week. Okay, so that's important. Let's keep going. Let me scroll towards the bottom. What letter was 1016? Yeah, that was N. Any questions on that? Okay, now I'm worried hopefully this works. If I want a confidence interval or a proportion, because that's what we're talking about, and it's very important to understand whether you're dealing with a proportion or a mean. This is a proportion because the survey question is, do you favor voting by mail for the next election? And the answer is yes or no. And when you have yes or no, that's proportion. This one better work. So now I just type in what I know. N was 1,016. X. Now we don't have X, but we can get it. How do we get X? The hint is the article didn't explicitly give us X, but we can find X. Any thoughts? So how do we get X? Just to let you know, X corresponds, it says up here, the number of successes, which means the number of yes answers. And the word success doesn't mean always a good thing. It just means someone said yes. How do I get the number of yeses? Yeah, we take 0 0.64 times 1,016. Okay. So let's do that. And so what should we, so what is X? It's another question that's a bit subtle. So what is X? Looking for a number. I don't see y'all typing it in, but hopefully you know. What's X? Let's 
This isn't too bad. Okay, so you might think it's 650.24, but that can't be X. You can't have 650.24 people say yes to the survey question. It makes no sense because you can't have decimals. We should use rules of rounding and you should use 650. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's use 650. And the confidence level is 0.95. That'll work. <laughs> Any questions on this? Okay, and this gives us our lower and upper bound, which is, I'm going to go two decimal places, 0.61 to 0.67. Any questions on that? So let me put that in here. So the confidence interval was 0 0.61 to 0 0.67. Is that clear? Uh, can you define P hat real quick? Oh, P hat is the proportion of the survey that respondents who said yes. That's P hat. So in this case, it was 0.64 because they told us. Okay. So the confidence interval is 0.61 to 0.67. So let's let me write down. Um, so state the conclusion. And the conclusion is with 95% confidence between 61% and 67% of all Americans and maybe American adults because that's who they asked. Um, agree, think, or agree, uh, want, um, yeah, think that uh, we should vote by mail in the next election. Any questions on the conclusion? Um, does it only work for qualitative surveys? Um, that's a good question. So the first thing is um, the the uh, program I used here uh, here. That's for the yes no question. Okay, the program I used here that was for the quantitative question, but confidence intervals are for both. Right, we found a confidence interval. right here. Do you see that? So we found a confidence interval that was quantitative. And then we also have a confidence interval over here, and that is the yes-no question. So confidence interval for both, but there's some, you know, refinements that you have to do. P hat is for yes-no question. Okay, X bar is for the um, quantitative question. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, the margin of error is plus or minus 3%. How do I come up with that? How did I come up with that plus or minus 3%? Yeah, what I did is I said, well, 60, 61 to 67 has a spread of 
right? Seven minus one is six. And half of that is a margin of error. Any questions on that? So by the way, do you think it's appropriate to say this in the article, most Americans favor voting by mail as option in November? What do you think? Is it now appropriate to say that? Yes, because we found the confidence interval to be between 61% and 71%, and that's definitely most Americans, okay? Definitely the, the majority by, by a lot. So there's nothing wrong with talking about all Americans as long as in the bottom, which they did, and they made a mistake on it, and we'll talk about the mistake. Uh, sorry, let's see. So check this out. Margin of sampling error, they called it plus or minus 4%. Okay. I found that Gallup usually overwrites, goes a little higher for the margin of error. I think it is because um, they don't want to look bad if they're wrong. That's my guess. But they always seem to go a little higher than they need to for the margin of error. But it really is plus or minus 3%, not 4%. It might also be that they copied and pasted from another survey and didn't notice. Yeah, we all make those mistakes. Okay. Any questions at all on this idea? Okay, let's talk about what does it mean to be 95% confident? Okay, which is a very different question than state your conclusion. Okay, and the idea is it's similar to what we did before when we did it with means. Okay, when we talked about kind of if we were to conduct another study many times, same idea. In fact, I'm going to even copy and paste that. So if we were to conduct and study many times with uh, was it 1,016 as a sample size, then each study would result in a different confidence interval. Kind of like on that picture we just had. Each time you do it, you get a different interval. Do you see that? There's just 20 of them. But if you did many, many times, then you're gonna have a whole lot of intervals. And what we can say is that 95% of these confidence intervals will contain the true population proportion of all Americans who think that we sh um, should vote by mail. In the next election. Any questions on this? Okay, I want to give you a big um, warning, and that is pay attention to this. Okay, I will ask you two things always, or not always, but often. I'll often write what is the conclusion? What can you conclude? And this is the way you answer with what you conclude. You start with 95% with confidence. I will not always, but sometimes I'll ask you, what does it mean to be 95% confident? And you'll notice it's very different 
between saying with 95% confidence, between 61 and 67% of all American adults think we um, should vote by mail in the next election versus if we were to conduct the study many times with 1,016 as the sample size and each study would result in a different confidence interval, 95% of the confidence intervals will contain the true population proportion of all Americans who think that we should vote by mail in the next election. So they're very different answers. So pay attention to the question. I wanna mention a couple things. This word all here, this word all here, we're talking about a co being confident with the population proportion, not the sample proportion. Sample proportion, we're 100% confident. We know what that was. Okay, but the population proportion, that's what we don't know, and that's what the confidence interval is about. Similarly, when we did the confidence interval here, it was about the population mean, not proportion, but mean, but definitely population. Any questions at all about confidence intervals? Okay, I will let you know on Thursday, first thing you're gonna be quizzed on this. So know how to find a confidence interval. And I promise the calculator will work. So if there's a bug in it, I'll fix it. Um, so you, you should know how to use a calculator. Um, and you should know how to state the conclusion. And you should also know how to talk about in words, what does it mean to be 95% confident? Okay, that's how I test. So be ready for that. Okay, you're gonna have your quiz is gonna have you do that. Okay, um, so that's the plan. And then after that, we'll do more examples on Thursday. And what we're not doing today, I knew there was no chance, is um, sample size calculations, and that'll be on Thursday also. So, are there any questions at all about this confidence interval idea? This is your chance. I think I'm gonna unshare because we're pretty much done. Again, uh, I guess technically the class goes till 25 after, but taking a break on Zoom is a little weird. I'll do it if everyone, if there's ever a request, I'll do that, but uh, a Zoom break is a little weird. <laughs> but I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. I think I'll drop the recording.